Hey class, welcome back. I hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, I'm not in the studio uh, today uh, doing the recordings, the studio at uh, College of Mid-America. I actually have my uh, my portable uh, green screen uh, behind me. I'm uh, here with a little lamp. Uh, so I hope everything turns out uh, well for this video. In fact, I'm making the three videos today. So uh, I just wanted to um, let you know that this uh, PowerPoint lecture coming up is really setting the stage uh, for the First World War. Uh, we have some things that take place in 19th century Europe, uh, which develops the nations of Europe. So these uh, lectures are uh, nation building of 19th century Europe. In the syllabus, it talks about uh, origins of World War One, and, and for this week, getting into World War One. We're not going to get into the First World War uh, uh, this week. Uh, we'll be doing that after. Uh, spring break uh, coming up, but uh, we will definitely talk in detail about the First World War. It's just that it's so important to understand what takes place in Europe uh, for the building of nations. So uh, today, we in this session, we are going to be talking about uh, just a general overview of the nation building and the Congress of Vienna in 1815 which had a great impact on the rest of Europe uh, throughout the rest of the 19th century because uh, it started to really t take over control of who would be the one to um, influence uh, the Germanic states, influence France, influence Italy, uh, those, uh, uh, those types of things. So in this uh, session here coming up, uh, we'll be talking about the Congress of Vienna. Okay, class, now we're going to move into our first lecture PowerPoint on uh, 19th century nation building. Uh, just an overview to nation building. The first question we have to ask is, what is a nation? What uh, technically um, is uh, the definition of a nation? What makes up a nation? So it is a community of people or peoples sharing a common culture, language, and history, living in a defined territory, and organize under a single government. So that's just a basic definition of what a nation is. Continuing with our overview, uh, basically the question is what does Europe do now? So we have finished up with the Napoleonic era, the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon has now been uh, sent off to St. Helena, the uh, island of his second exile where he will remain the rest of his life. And basically what's happened is the Napoleonic Wars have shattered Europe. The ro rulers have um, been dethroned. There's been a lot of changeover, a lot of problems in Europe. And uh, rulers have been dethroned. Lands have been destroyed. Armies have wiped out, been wiped out. If you remember, uh, just for the, for the French army, uh, 600,000 had gone into uh, Russia with Napoleon. And uh, just a fraction of them returned uh, during the first phase of Napoleon's uh, rule. So armies have been wiped out. Uh, the revolutionary ideas continue to spread across Europe. And uh, some peoples, uh, they gained freedoms, and that was more in, in regards to some uh, enlightenment ideals and, and people being able to vote and that sort of an idea. Uh, areas united along common ideals. So areas become united together. They're kind of collecting together with the same common ideal. So um, this is just, again, an overview of nation building and basically the, the condition of Europe. So pretty much the rest of this PowerPoint, we're going to be talking about the Congress of Vienna of 1815. The Congress of Vienna, 1815, is a pretty important event that takes place in Europe because it pretty much uh, sets up the stage uh, for uh, 19th century Europe and what goes on there, which will then set another stage for the First World War. So uh, before we get into the Congress of Vienna itself, there's some pre-Congress concerns. What is going on that they would have to call for a Congress? in Vienna, which would be in, in Austria, Vienna, Austria. So number one, the conservatives feared the revolutionary ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity, and that, that it might spread. These are Enlightenment ideals. And the conservatives would be, would be more uh, along the lines of the pro-monarchy 
they would want uh, a strong uh, single head government and uh, they, they feared the revolutionary ideas. Number two, the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars caused many in Europe to have strong feelings of national identity and experimentation with revolution. So after the, Rev- the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars, it's kind of like what, what do the people in Europe, uh, what do they do, how, how do they identify themselves? And they started to uh, have this idea of a national identity. So here's an example. France, France's continuous revolutionary ideals. Uh, after Napoleon, France had many years of turmoil during the early 19th century. So even though Napoleon is out of the picture, uh, don't think France is back to you know, just living a, a peaceful, happy life. There were still um, uh, times of turmoil. There was a July Revolution of 1830 and then a February Revolution of 1848. So they don't... They don't uh, they don't have a real peaceful life, but throughout Europe, there's this uh, feeling of, of a national identity, and who who are we, what are we going to stand for, and there's this experimentation uh, with revolution. So these again, these are concerns before the Congress, before the Vienna, Congress of Vienna. Number three, the spread of revolutionary ideas undermined what little European stability remained. And that stability would be under the monarchies that remained in Europe. So the revolutionary time is is unstable. There's a lot of fighting, but the spread of these ideas would undermine what other uh, monarchies in Europe, um, what power they still had. And so number four, pro-monarchy saw the danger of revolution in their lands. Okay, so this is pre-Congress concerns. We have a fear of revolutionary ideas. The French Revolution caused many in Europe to have strong feelings of national identity and experimentation with revolution. The spread of revolutionary ideas undermined what little European stability there was, and pro-monarchy saw the danger of revolution in their lands. So at the Congress, we have Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia met to restore the way things were. And so the question is, who's not there? Well, clearly we see that France is not there. And uh, that's going to be a, kind of a telling tale of, uh, of the state of France because there's still so much turmoil going on in France. So they met in Vienna, Austria to restore Europe to pre-revolutionary order. Uh, there's just a picture of Congress of Vienna, some drawing or almost kind of cartoony, but you see here there's a map, and whenever you get a bunch of rulers from different countries around a map, uh, that's never good because they're going to be making decisions about who's where and who's who on this map, which may divide and, and cause other problems, which of course it will in this case. Okay, so the Congress of Vienna, so it's taking place, uh, Prince Clemens von Metternich was the Austrian foreign minister. And he guided the Congress to dismantle France's Napoleonic Empire and return sovereignty to the monarchy. So these lands that Napoleon had invaded and and uh, basically had laid waste to, they wanted to bring back the sovereignty of the monarchies to those lands. He feared a revolution would take place in Austria because of the numerous cultures in Austria. So he's trying to shore up his own power base by making sure the different cultures in Austria don't revolt themselves. And so there's some nationalities that are in Austria, Germans, Italians, Czechs, Slovaks, Poles, Serbs, Croats, a lot of different national backgrounds there. And if they unite along the common idea of overthrow, or revolution, then that would be a threat to the monarchy. So Prince Clemens is very concerned about this. Okay, there he is. So what were the decisions that were made at the Congress of Vienna? Number one was return royal families to the throne. And it was a hope to suppress nationalism, revolutionary ideas. Number two, 
to create a balance of power. And the idea was that no one nation would be stronger than any other nation. And the simple question is, how does this even work? Because the nations did not have the same amount of resources. They did not have the same amount of, of uh, population. They did not have the same amount of territory. Um, so how does it even work where one nation would not be stronger than another? There's always going to be strong nations that are stronger than another. And um, clearly, Austria is going to want to be uh, more powerful than others. That's why they uh, are kind of holding this Congress in the first place, because they want to be the most powerful in their area so they're, they're not threatened. Number three, Russia would extend its territory over Poland and Finland. Number four, the Congress of Vienna created the Deutscher Bund, which basically means German Confederation. Okay, so we're going to talk about that here in the next slide. They created the German Confederation. This is kind of important because it's setting the stage for the creation of Germany. So the Deutsche Bund, an association of 39 German states in Central Europe. They began to coordinate economies of the states. And this Deutsche Bund would replace the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, these states were part of the Holy Roman Empire before Napoleon. But then Napoleon actually enveloped the Holy Roman Empire into his empire when he conquered Europe. So these states come together, they coordinate economies, they're an association, they're connected loosely uh, politically, they have a loose political connection, they form a mutual military defense for the association, and the delegates met in a federal assembly under Austrian leadership. Okay, so clearly we're not at the point of an actual creation of Germany, but it's starting to come together. They're associating with one another, they're coordinating their economies, they have a mutual defense for one another, military defense for one another. They meet in a federal assembly, but the problem is that it's under Austrian leadership. And this is going to come up later on with Otto von Bismarck when he uh, basically starts the Franco, uh, I'm sorry, the um, uh, Austrian Prussian War. Okay, so here's a map of Europe. It's basically the German Confederation um, and, the, and the makeup of it in 1815. So this is what the Congress of Vienna has kind of established with the, uh, the Deutsche Bund and this loose association of all of these states. And so you can see there... They're just You don't need to know the names or anything. It's just You can just tell that there's a lot of different city-states. Some are very tiny, some are very large, and they are uh, basically a loose confederation. So down here, this is Switzerland down here. Okay. There's Prussia. So anyway, that's just a, a map of the German confederation just to give you an idea of what it looked like. Okay, so the decisions of the Congress of Vienna continued. Number five, the Holy Alliance. Uh, monarchs of Prussia, Austria, and Russia joined together to prevent the revolutionary ideas from entering their nations and to maintain their royal thrones. And there are three purposes of the Holy Alliance. Uh, first is to create a strong monarchy monarchy with hereditary rule. So they would they were establishing that their children would come to power, then their grandchildren would come to power. So there's a, there's a rule based on being birthed in a uh, royal family. Uh, the second purpose is uh, to suppress any democratic or nationalistic movements that might spring up. Okay, so this is the nationalistic movement of that would be a kind of revolutionary, uh, uh, that kind of something that would threaten the monarchy. They wanted to suppress that. Uh, third purpose was to redesign the boundaries of Europe. Okay, so again, when you get nations getting good, Prussia, Austria, and Russia getting together, and they're going to start redesigning the boundaries of Europe, it's not going to turn out well. Result. 
So the result of the Congress of Vienna was limited success for about 90 years. Uh, the reason I say it's limited is that uh, they, uh, they do establish a lot of the monarchies back in Europe, but it's, as I've said, it's going to be a, a power play for about 90 years all the way to where war, the First World War begins. So nowhere near perfect, and it is the setting the stage for the First World War. Okay, so highlighted in yellow on the PowerPoint is this term called the Concert of Europe. And this term is basically how the balance of power in Europe is played out on the world stage that would end up destabilizing Europe. So the whole point of this was to stabilize Europe under monarchies, but as the 90 years go by, there's all kinds of events taking place throughout the world, and a lot of it rooted in Europe, and these power plays are being made in an attempt to stabilize Europe, but in the end, all it does is destabilize Europe because uh, it, it aligns the treaties that will start the First World War. From 1815 to 1914 is the Concert of Europe. Beginning with the Congress of Vienna, Europe would have seven more Congresses, and they all have their own names. We don't need to worry about that, but there's going to be seven more Congresses Again, all to stabilize Europe, but in the end, it destabilizes it. The Holy Alliance that we just talked about would morph into the Quadruple Alliance when Britain joins in, and then further into the Quintuple Alliance when France finally joins in, because France, for the first half of the 19th century, is having all kinds of problems, and then they finally do start to stabilize towards the second half of the 19th century, and... They join into the alliance also, so the Holy Alliance has grown. And again, this would lead up to World War I, 90 years from 1815 to 1914 is about, that's 99 years, but um, almost 100 years, lead to World War I. Uh, the nations begin to develop a strong sense of nationalism. Now, this is very important that you understand the difference here of this nationalism compared to the earlier nationalism. The earlier nationalism that I just talked about a few minutes ago is kind of this revolutionary idea of, of who are we as a country. Uh, let's say um, in France, we're no longer uh, just under the king of France, but we are Frenchmen. We we are revolutionary and we have this national ideal that we are striving towards to have um, our, our freedoms and all of that. Now I'm going to transition to the word nationalism here on the screen, meaning a pride in, in, in your country, in your nation, um, who you identify with and you have pride, you're proud to be German, you're proud to be Austrian, you're proud to be French, you're proud to be British. And, and you really start to get a sense of loyalty to, uh, to the nation itself. Uh, not so much loyalty to um, a, a revolutionary ideal like the first type of nationalism I spoke about. Now we have a nationalism where they're, they're really loyal to the community, to the state, to the monarch. Uh, whatever whatever um, the authority is that is established in the land, the people start to follow that and become loyal to that. So you see here on the slide, it leads to World War I where the nations began to develop a strong sense of nationalism. And there's a couple of points under this that I've just kind of mentioned briefly, uh, not on revolutionary ideals, but on national pride. They really start to pride themselves with who they are. Uh, the British, proud to be British proud to have their empire, proud to have their colonies, proud to have their navy, uh, even their land army, because during the 19th century, they fight a lot of land battles under uh, Queen Victoria's reign. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different wars. In fact, I just finished reading a little book called uh, Victoria's Little Wars, where uh, the British army is all over the world fighting battles, everything from the the Zulus in Africa to uh, Indian Rebellion in India. There's just different different wars all, all over the place. Uh, Afghanistan, they fight in Afghanistan. 
So you see that uh, the people have a national pride. The people have a strong sense of identity, and this is enhanced by colonialism. Uh, we're not going to have a lot of time on colonialism, but br uh, Europe really started to spread out during the 19th century, and and the the people wanted that uh, that nationalistic uh, push that that France has. Uh, some colonies in North Africa, that Great Britain has India and South Africa and other parts of the world. So uh, there's there's different uh, ways that a country can have a strong sense of identity, but when you belong to a country that's spreading out in uh, colonial endeavors, uh, you can really identify uh, with your country. Like, that is my country. My country is really getting strong. People had a sense of loyalty to their community and to their state. Uh, in other words, to their monarchies. No matter what governmental structure that they had, uh, the people were really becoming loyal to their government. Support of nationalism came to political support. So when, when a person says, I'm proud of, my, proud of my country, I identify as, let's say, British in this example, I'm loyal to my queen, Queen Victoria, I'm loyal to my country, uh, and, and they're proud of that, then they become politically supportive. They start to say, hey, the government can do these different things. The government can wage war. The government can protect us. The government can be on the world stage and uh, deal with other countries and their, and their uh, pressures on us or their uh, ideas of expansion. We can meet that and we maybe even even beat that. So they have this great sense of support for their government. And the reason I say all of this is that this is how millions of people would mobilize for war under their nation's flag during World War I. In parentheses at the bottom of the screen, it says 100 years earlier, meaning 100 years before World War I, millions were mobilizing against their own monarchies. So if you think about this, in the beginning of the 19th century, you had so many people revolting in France and, and other areas. Again, France, the French Revolution was not the only revolution, uh, but there was uh, Europe was in turmoil. Just millions of people mobilizing against their own countries. 100 years later, millions of people would mobilize under their country, under their flag, under their king or queen, under their government to go to war in the First World War. So you see this big shift, major shift in their ideas from revolution to nationalistic pride, and we will go to the trenches of World War I to beat the enemy. Here's a map of Europe in 1815. And you can see all the different uh, countries. Obviously, you see uh, Spain and France and England. But notice uh, Germany is just a big mess. And just all these little different city-states, kind of like the map I showed earlier. Uh, you see Poland and part of Austria and the Russian Empire. That It's all, all different and changed. Italy is a bunch of different states. You see the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, the Papal States. It's just not, there's nothing consolidated here in 1815. For Italy, uh, the Ottoman Empire controls uh, Turkey and into Greece. So, this is Europe in 1815. This is the map that the Congress of Vienna has on the table. And this is Europe in 1914. So after after uh, that 90 years goes by and all of the different things that take place during the 19th century, you see this is basically the countries of of Europe that go to war uh, in the First World War. So you see, again, Spain, France, United Kingdom, uh, Russia. You see these uh, these countries that were on the previous map right there. But now notice you have Italy down here, which is now a, a nation itself. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But you have nation of Italy down here. You have the, the empire of Germany. Okay, so you see this outline here. Well, remember back on this map, it was just a bunch of city-states. So within from 1815 to 1914, now you have the establishment of Germany, the establishment of Austria-Hungary. Again, here's Empire of Austria. Okay, so then you have Austria-Hungary. And then notice down here, look at this. You have Greece, Albania, Montenegro, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, and then Turkey, which is basically the old Ottoman Empire. So you have it right here. 
So the Ottoman Empire has has fallen apart, and this has all turned into little um, little countries: Albania, Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece. Okay, so and th and this is going to play a part in uh, the beginning of World War One uh, here, this area right in here. So you see the different uh, the different countries. Ninety years, and you have basically redrawn uh, a majority of of Europe. Okay, that's uh, that's it for this PowerPoint. I'll see you just in a second. Okay, class, that's going to be it for today. Uh, we will be uh, focusing in on uh, the second part next time, where we will be looking at um, the the Jewish people in 19th century uh, Europe and what takes place with them, and also uh, with the establishment of Italy. So that'll be coming up in the next PowerPoint. Other than that, take care.